What will you do in this situation? Imagine there were elections for high-paying positions in the government. Anyone can apply and be a candidate. But to win the position, a candidate needs to be among the top 20 applicants by votes. The thing here is that when a candidate wins, he needs to distribute a large part of his salary among the people who voted for him. Some will distribute 70%, some will distribute 80%, and so on. So, if you vote for a candidate and he wins, you will make money each month. But the problem here is that the candidate who will pay you the highest percentage may not be the best qualified one for this position, and he may take many wrong decisions if he wins. On the other hand, the qualified candidate will not pay you that much. So, what will you do in this situation? Will you choose the qualified candidate or will you choose the candidate who will pay a higher percentage each month? Welcome to Cryptobi, where we explain cryptocurrencies and DeFi topics in the most simple and beginner-friendly way. In this video, you will know what is delegated proof of stake and how it actually works, and then we will talk about its advantages and its limitations, so let's get started. So, what did you choose? Well, the problem you are facing right now is the same problem some users may face when choosing which delegate to vote for in delegated proof of stake. So, what does that mean? Don't get confused, we'll explain all of this in a minute. But before we explain delegated proof of stake, you first need to understand what is proof of stake at the first place. You may know that any blockchain is a decentralized or a distributed network. So, there is no central authority keeping a record of all users' accounts their balances, and transactions. On a distributed network, there are many computers connected, and each computer may have a different version of the user's accounts, balances, and transactions. So any blockchain needs a way for all computers to reach agreement on the correct version of the records and on who has the right to verify the next block or group of transactions. The way the computers reach this agreement is called a consensus mechanism. So the proof of stake is a consensus mechanism, which means that it is a way computers on the network agree on the correct version of records and decide who has the right to verify the next block of transactions. In proof of stake, the computers who verify transactions on the network are called validators. And to be able to join the network as a validator, you need to set up your computer and then lock up a large amount of tokens as a collateral on the network, which is known as staking. These tokens act like a guarantee that you will not act maliciously or try to approve fraudulent transactions. If you were found approving fraudulent transactions or doing anything shady trying to harm the network, then some or all of your lock tokens may be taken. So what happens in proof of stake is that for each new block of transactions, the network will randomly choose a validator to verify the transactions. Like what we said, the selection is done randomly, but the more tokens you stake or lock up, the higher your chances of getting selected by the network. When a validator verifies a block of transactions, it then needs to send it to other validators on the network to vote on it. If fraudulent transactions were found, they will reject the block. But if everything is okay, they will accept it, and the validator who produced the block will get rewarded by new coins from the network. So that is generally how proof of stake works. Let's now get to the delegated proof of stake. So in delegated proof of stake, the token holders are in control, which means that they get to choose who they trust to validate the transactions on the network. The computers chosen to validate the transactions here are called witnesses or delegates, and that is why it is called delegated proof of stake. It works similar to an election. So what happens is that anyone on the network can apply to be a candidate witness. On some networks, they may need to stake or lock up some tokens as collateral, but unlike proof of stake, a witness here doesn't need to lock up a lot of tokens to be selected. Like what we said, token holders here have the power to vote for the candidates they think are honest and suitable to verify transactions on the network. For the token holders to be able to vote, they need to stake or freeze their tokens on the network, which gives them voting power. Freezing the tokens here mean that you can't send them to anyone or use them on any application, and then the voting power that each user gets is proportionate to the number of tokens he freezes, so the more tokens you freeze, the higher voting power you get. The term voting power here is used as a unit, so freezing one token will give you one voting power, which is like one vote. After getting voting power, users are free to do whatever they want. They can assign their voting power to vote for a specific candidate. They can give this voting power to someone to vote on their behalf, 
or they can even vote for more than one candidate by splitting the votes they have and assigning different percentages to different candidates. Now, you may be thinking, why would someone freeze his tokens to vote for a candidate? Well, we will explain this point in a minute. But now, you should know that at any time, the network has a list of all candidates and the votes each one of them got. Only the top witnesses who got the most votes get the chance to verify transactions and add new blocks to the blockchain. So here, the witness doesn't need to lock up a lot of tokens to be selected, he just needs many users who have a lot of tokens to vote for him. And, for that to happen, he has to have a very good reputation among the community. Through making positive contributions to the project, like helping in writing code and solving bugs, working to add new members to the community, helping with the marketing campaigns, or with any other tasks that will help the project succeed. The number of top witnesses who can win is different from a network to another. In Tron, for example, the top 27 witnesses get the right to produce blocks. In EOS, on the other hand, only the top 21 witnesses can verify transactions. Let's say, for example, that only the top 10 witnesses get to produce blocks, so each witness will have a turn to produce a block. In his turn, a witness will gather some unconfirmed transactions, verifies them and makes sure that everything is okay, then adds them to a block. This block will then be sent to the other nine top witnesses. So, they will quickly validate it. If the block and all the transactions in it are valid, then they accept it and it gets added to the blockchain, and the witness who produced this block will then get rewarded for his work with new tokens. This reward is split among the witness and the users who voted for him. Some witnesses take 20% commission, some take 30%, but the rest goes to the users. And that is the reason users freeze their tokens to vote at the first place, they earn interest on their tokens. Some networks like Tron reward their users for staking their tokens and voting, this reward is different from the split they take from the witnesses. Before we continue, if you got the idea and have been enjoying the video so far, hit the like button, as a new channel, it really helps us. So, after all the top witnesses finish producing their blocks, they get reordered, which means that each one of them takes a different turn in the next round, and they will continue producing blocks for a specified period of time, it can be 3 hours, 6 hours, sometimes more, it depends on the network. After this period, we recount the votes again by taking another look at the list of witnesses and the votes each one got. So we will remove the witnesses who fell outside the top 10 list and add any other witnesses who received enough votes to get in the top 10 witnesses list. During this vote's recounting period, no new blocks are produced, but it is very short and it may last for just 10 seconds. So, it is pretty obvious that any top witness always have the threat of losing his spot if he was found to be acting maliciously, approving fraudulent transactions, or even going offline. Even if he is not doing any of that, to keep his spot in the top witnesses list, he needs to continue making positive contributions to the network, as the token holders are free to change their mind and vote for another candidate at any time. So that gets us to the problem we explained at the beginning, you as a token holder, who will you vote for, the most suitable witness who have a very good reputation and always making contributions to the project? Or the witness who takes the least commission? Now you may be thinking, so the network has 20 block producers only, doesn't that make it centralized? Well, that's actually true, in a blockchain with small number of block producers, we need to trust that the small group of witnesses will act honestly, but still, the token holders are the ones who actually choose who they want to trust as the centralized party and they get to do this through decentralized voting. So, in reality, anyone can still participate in the voting process and anyone can be a candidate witness and, at any time, the token holders can change who is in charge of verifying the transactions by voting for other witnesses. On most networks, token holders can also vote to change other things, like how many witnesses produce blocks, the block size, and the rewards that are given to the witnesses and voters. This delegated proof of stake mechanism we just explained is used in Tron, EOS, and Lisk. You may also hear that Cardano uses delegated proof of stake, but that is actually not true. Cardano uses their modified version of proof of stake, known as Ouroboros. Now let's talk about the advantages of the delegated proof of stake. So, first of all, there is no energy wasted in choosing who gets to produce the next block like what happens with proof-of-work in Bitcoin. Also, witnesses don't need very powerful expensive computers to verify the transactions and participate in consensus. The delegated proof-of-stake is also very fast and scalable, as the number of top witnesses is usually low, which means that they can transfer messages between each other very quickly. 
A block on Tron is produced every 3 seconds, but on the Bitcoin blockchain for example, a new block is produced every 10 minutes. Another advantage of delegated proof-of-stake is that it gives the chance for witnesses who hold small amount of tokens to participate in verifying transactions and producing blocks if they receive enough votes from the community, which is something that doesn't happen in the traditional proof-of-stake. Another good thing about delegated proof-of-stake is that the token holders are always in control of the network through democratic voting. At any time they can change witnesses or any other aspect they want to change on the network. Now let's get to the disadvantages. So, the first disadvantage here is that for the delegated proof of stake to be decentralized, it requires participation from the community members in the voting process. Some users who hold small amounts of tokens may think that their voting won't change anything and they won't earn a lot of interest anyway, so they may not participate. This may allow whales with large amounts of tokens to have control over the network and over who gets the right to produce blocks. This can be a big problem in projects where venture capital funds hold a large percentage of tokens, as this gives the VCs total control over the project if many other token holders don't participate in voting. If this happens, a VC can split its voting power among the witnesses they want to produce blocks. Even if that doesn't happen, another disadvantage here is like what we said, the block production is centralized among a small group of witnesses. So they may collude together or even be bribed to censor transactions on the network, which simply means preventing some people or addresses from making transactions. At the end of this video, we really hope you learned what you need to know about the delegated proof of stake and if you liked our video, hit the like button, let us know in the comments if you have any questions or video ideas, and subscribe to our channel and turn on the notifications so you don't miss our new videos. Thanks for watching.